Hi, Mark. Hi, Jill. <laughs> we don't care if it's recorded. I no, think we're good with it being recorded. That's uh, fine. Okay. I think. Then I have to go to security. I'm just going to run to the restroom real quick. Unless we want to unrecord it until we actually start, but we'd have to remember to record it. I don't know that we want all this first 15 minutes recorded, but I what do you will. Know? I will stop recording. All right, recording is on. Um, welcome everybody to the uh, second day of the CRN six uh, uh, sessions on sex work in the law. Um, and today our panel is on the path towards decriminalization in the United States, but it is important to note that immediately after this, there is another panel on the path towards decrim that's gonna have folks from the US as well as from across the globe. So I think both panels are gonna be talking about a, uh, a global perspective on, um, on uh, decriminalization or the path to decriminalization. Um, and so uh, I uh, urge you to say that. And also if you want to see other sessions, you can just search in the LSA for other CRN6 sessions we have some for the rest of today and also on Sunday, a few, I think. Um, so, uh, Menica, is there any other announcements or was that good? Okay. Um, everybody make sure you mute yourself when you come in and we'll talk for a few minutes. Everybody will talk for maybe five to 10 minutes and then we will open it up for questions and discussion. Um, everybody on the panel here is coming from different uh, professions and different aspects of, of the kind of work that, that's done on decrim. Uh, so we'll have a good variety of different perspectives on here. Um, and so let's just begin and I'll throw it out to Caitlin Bailey to start us off. Sure. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Caitlin Bailey. I'm the communications director for Decriminalized Sex Work, and I also host the podcast, uh, The Oldest Profession. Um, before I start any of these talks, but especially um, at someplace like the Law and Society um, Conference, I want to preface this by saying that I am not a historian. Um, I am a stand-up comedian by training, um, but I am obsessed with sex worker history. Um, I have, uh, I'm a former sex worker myself. I did full service um, escorting work in Raleigh, North Carolina in 2004, 2005, uh, during uh, what I consider now in retrospect to be a bit of a golden age of sex work. And we'll talk about that. And then again in uh, New York City between uh, 2011, 2015. Um, but let's talk about the history of sex work in the United States from a legal perspective. And I think it's really important to understand the historical context uh, of the way that the, the, the places where a lot of these fights are happening um, from a historical perspective, in addition to uh, from a, a precedent perspective, which is sort of slightly different. Um, so back in the Civil War is when we actually get our first example of an attempt to regulate and legalize prostitution. Um, the uh, Nashville during the, uh, during the Civil War was a place where a lot of soldiers and sex workers were interacting, which is uh, a historic combination. Um, and one of the generals uh, was recognizing that STDs and venereal disease uh, was a huge problem. And so he made an effort to ship out uh, all of the sex workers in Nashville. So he filled a riverboat, uh, the USS Idaho, uh, which I think is great. Uh, Idaho, uh, the hose on the Idaho. Uh, so um, so he, he fills this riverboat uh, with notorious sex workers and makes an effort to send them off, but no other port will accept them. And the sex workers on the boat uh, threw such a fit that they were returned to Nashville. And so the response to this was to uh, register um, all of the sex workers as they came off the boat and issue licenses to sex workers who were operating in Nashville that would come with STD tests. Now, an STD test in 1863 isn't an STD test. It's just really an excuse, I think, to like sort of sexually assault women that have a reputation, but we can get into all of those details later. But um, this is the first example of legalizing uh, sex work. And I think it's important to understand that it was done 
for the military, not to empower workers, not to empower sex workers, and not to improve their lives, but rather to help the army do army stuff. Um, fast forward, one of the first federal anti-prostitution laws that we see is also one of our first federal anti-prostitution laws. And so that is the 1845 Page Act, which specified that uh, Chinese women um, were not allowed to immigrate to the United States for immoral purposes. And this is language that we, we see again and we will revisit. This is uh, one of our first efforts to, um, to control immigration uh, during this period. Of course, it culminates with the much more explicit, um, I think it's 1882, uh, anti-Chinese um, immigration law, so which it becomes more explicit. Um, I think that's an important history to dwell on because I think that anti-sex work laws have sort of always been used to target minority communities in a similar way that uh, anti-drug laws have been used. Um, and certainly the anti-immigration history and anti-sex work history uh, go hand in hand. Um, another uh, conversation that is happening during this period, the Gilded Age um, in the 1870s, is anti-obscenity um, anti laws and purity laws. There seems to be sort of a new obsession with protecting the chastity of women. Now, a lot of this has to do with the fact that white middle-class women are seeing more freedom of movement than they ever have in US history before uh, with the invention of, of the bicycle and uh, trains and stuff. Uh, so women are moving around, uh, which makes people anxious. You're also seeing the wake of the Civil War, the recent emancipation uh, of Black people in the United States ca is causing some racial anxiety in addition to immigration waves. So you're seeing a lot of reactionary legislation that's very, very grounded in racist ideas um, and misogynistic, paternalistic ideas. And this all culminates in something that is called the White Slave Law of 1910. So in the wake, uh, during Reconstruction, um, and in the lead up to the Jim Crow laws and the racist legislation that gets applied to the South, there is this idea that sort of, uh, that white women are uniquely endangered by their exposure uh, to black and immigrant uh, brown men, right? And so uh, white supremacy and like the, the mission of the KKK gets wrapped in this shield of uh, chivalry, that uh, this idea that we are protecting white women by really cracking down on black and brown men because uh, white slaves are being kidnapped and sold into, uh, into sexual slavery, which is, um, a paradigm and way of thinking that uh, we're familiar with today. So they passed the white slave law, um, which is, I mean, e explicitly racist and like not, and historians are unanimous, by the way, that this was not uh, an actual phenomenon. This is a media sensation that's very similar to the sex panic, the satanic, uh, satanic panic that we're familiar with of the 1980s. That's sort of a response to AIDS. That's sort of what white slavery was, right? There weren't like actual satanic cults in basements in preschools, and there weren't actual white slaves uh, in the, the 1910s. But it's this paradigm when combined, uh, well, we'll get into that later, but it's this paradigm that results in some of the uh, first anti-brothel, uh, anti-prostitution laws in the U.S. that actually shut down the brothels. It's done in the name of saving the girls. So you see the anti-white slave law passed in 1910, and then cities and states throughout the United States in this sort of like sweep pass all of these moral reform purity laws uh, that, uh, that, that close the brothels, which results in the first uh, protest by prostitutes in the United States. In 1917, 300 uh, sex workers marched on the moral reformers' home uh, in response to the brothel closer, closures in San Francisco. Um, and they, they held a protest that was covered by the press. And they asked a question, where, uh, where do you want us to go? Which I think is, is something that has united the sex worker rights movement um, forever. So this, you know, 1917, this happens to, to take us up to, I can do the rest of this in five minutes. I'm sorry, I'm dwelling. I need to get through this quickly. Oh, all right, cool. Um, so 1917 is the, the beginnings of America's involvement in World War I. And this is when we take that initial idea from the Civil War that it's safer and healthier for uh, soldiers if we can register and control and regulate and monitor all of the sex workers that they're being exposed to. Um, and this 
this becomes the American plan. Um, and we modeled it off of the British Contagious Diseases Acts, if, if any of you guys are familiar with that history. Uh, but what it essentially did is it empowered local law enforcement around military bases to round up uh, loose women, subject them to STD tests, mandatory STD tests, and then if they were found to be contagious, uh, they would have to be registered as sex workers, which would follow them forever. Uh, they would have to be put into a lock hospital where they were treated with mercury and arsenic. Uh, and it, this, this began the sort of like militarization and policing of prostitution uh, that, we, that we know and hate today. Uh, this is when you start to see pimps um, who aggressively replace madams uh, in the sex work economy because women suddenly need male escorts to protect them uh, from the police, which start more aggressively policing prostitution. And in addition to uh, known sex workers who get caught up in this human rights violation, it also, of course, targets poor minority women, gender nonconforming women, basically like a, anyone uh, that's presenting female that makes the wrong kind of eye contact with a cop between 1917 and 1971 gets, or 19, sorry, 75, gets rounded up uh, and subjected to an STD test. And because we're a global hegemon, that policy gets exported to the rest of the world, which I'm sure you'll learn about in the next session when we talk about global uh, sex worker rights. Um, so this takes us up to 1971, where I want to talk about sort of two quick divergent paths. Uh, this is when you see the first legalized uh, brothels in Nevada, uh, where you have, which is a, a little bit of a complex history that I'm sure uh, Barbara knows a little bit more about, but essentially the mafia from New York, like if you've seen The Godfather, right, the mafia convinces uh, in sort of like a, a boys club way to give them a legal monopoly on controlling the sex workers of Nevada. And so you get brothels that are similar to the Civil War and you know the uh, American plan that are registered. Um, and we pass a lot of whorephobic legislation that is all very grounded in the idea of controlling the movement of sex workers in an effort to like control STDs or like the dangerous chaos energy that we bring to communities. Um, also in the early 1970s, you see the emergence of the contemporary sex worker rights movement. In 1973, uh, Margot St. James founds COYOTE, which uh, is an acronym for Call Off Your Old Tired Ethics. Uh, she is a fascinating case. I don't want to dwell too much into it. We're going to be doing an episode on her on the Oldest Profession podcast, and I can go on and on and on. But essentially, an explicit sex worker rights organization is founded in 1973. And one of the things among the many wins that Coyote gets is that she puts an end to the mandatory STD checks uh, in San Francisco, and uh, she challenges the Rhode Island uh, prostitution law and brings a case in 1979 challenging uh, the anti-prostitution law on the grounds of sex discrimination, because both buying and selling were criminalized, but only uh, sex workers were being charged. Uh, in a fun twist that I'm sure Melissa will get into in more detail, uh, the um, a judge in this civil case agrees with Coyote that this is an example of sex discrimination, charges the Rhode Island legislature with changing the law. They failed to do that and nobody noticed until 2003 uh, when an attorney discovered that uh, indoor prostitution in Rhode Island was in fact decriminalized due to this uh, you know, congressional inaction and judicial decision. And so for a period of about six years, uh, se indoor sex work in Rhode Island is in fact decriminalized because there is no law, but it's recriminalized in 2009 because, because we're bad at things. But uh, yeah, so that caveat. Um, that takes us up to the 1980s. Um, the AIDS epidemic, uh, the porn wars that raged through the feminist movement, which if you're not watching Mrs. America, you absolutely should, um, do a lot to sort of curtail the growing sex worker rights movement and where we are very closely tied to the LGBT rights movement, right? Some of the, the first people to throw stones at Stonewall were uh, you know, trans women of color. Like we've been very much involved in that movement, but the AIDS epidemic and the sex panic that comes in its wake uh, really prevents 
uh, common sense legislation for all of the reasons that I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, but in 2003, um, in response to the Green River Killer in Seattle, uh, a group of mourners uh, who were also sex workers formed an organization called Swap USA uh, and established a holiday, uh, December 17th, which is the International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers. Um, and they charged police officers, essentially, with not taking their murders seriously, which was true. Uh, police officers had gotten into the habit of writing uh, no humans involved on missing persons uh, cases when, uh, when it was a known sex worker. And so um, that begins uh, sort of a, a sex worker rights movement that is, is very rights-based. Um, they join um, AIDS activists uh, and LGBT folks to fight uh, some of this legislation and, and try to drum up the, the humanity of sex workers. Uh, from 2005 to 2010, there's an excellent magazine called Spread Magazine that chronicles a lot of this great work. I'd encourage you uh, to look into that. Uh, but at the same time, and for opposite reasons, from 2006 until now, the federal government has been partnering with local law enforcement um, for an operation called Operation Cross Country that like so much of the prostitution legislation in this country, um, is driven by this idea of rescuing and saving uh, victims, but is in fact uh, about rounding up people, uh, saddling them uh, with criminal records, and, and funneling them into what I think everyone here knows to be uh, a, a deeply flawed criminal justice system. Um, so in 2018, um, SESTA-FOSTA was signed into law by Donald Trump. Uh, that is an anti-obscenity law, which also has a history. Like in the 1870s, they passed an anti-obscenity law. It was used to, you know, uh, hurt the first woman to run for president and censored Margaret Sanger with birth control. There's a long history of that. But in, in 2018, SESTA-FOSTA tried to erase sex work from the internet, again, in the name of an anti-trafficking move. And they didn't do that. Uh, they caused a lot of harm and a lot of damage, but they also sparked the sex, uh, another wave or re-energized uh, the sex worker rights movement. And a lot of organizations have come out since then. Um, and so we are now, that brings us sort of more to today. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's all the context. I sort of want to pause here, and I know that that was like a lot of information that came out very quickly, but I think we've gotten to sort of like a where we're at, and I want to check in with any like clarifying questions that maybe that brought up before I move on uh, to our next speaker, who will talk about this from a different angle. People can add questions in the chat as well, if you want. All right, well, that, uh, that takes us from the Civil War to today in what looks like 20 minutes, so great. <laughs> oh, right. Okay, I think then it's on to me, right? Uh, thank you, Caitlin. I always love hearing uh, the historical perspective um, since I'm gonna be doing uh, a big, you know, my perspective is always as a lawyer. But to tie it to what Caitlin was talking about, I went to law school to decriminalize prostitution because of the Contagious Diseases Acts, <laughs> the turn of the century in Eng England and France, um, which sort of doesn't sound like it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I remember learning about it as an undergrad in the late 90s and being like, this is the most fucked up shit ever. And I already knew I was probably gonna go to law school um, and I'm like, I'm going to go to law school and fight for decrim. And this was in the late 90s, early 2000s. So, yeah. And it was because of the, the fucking Contagious Diseases Act. Um, so, yeah, here we are. Um, so I'm an attorney. I uh, have been an activist for sex worker rights for almost 20 years um, since being, you know, an undergrad in the late 90s. So a little more than 20 years. Um, I went to law school in the early 2000s, specifically to fight for the decriminalization of prostitution, which then seemed like, you know, everyone thought I was fucking insane. Um, and now, you know, we're sort of getting there, which is really exciting because of all the history 
that Caitlin referenced and because of all the work of those who've come before us, you know? And so I think setting this discussion up with the historical perspective is, is really like honoring the, um, the sex workers and the activists that have come before all of us, you know, and the work that lays a foundation to being able to move forward, right? Towards decrim eventually, right? This is all, you know, building blocks. It's not just, you know, something that can happen overnight. Um, so in terms of, you know, bringing us to today and where the sort of legal landscape is in the United States, you know, I'm not going to talk about other countries. I know that there is a panel. Um, I know that Jill and, and some other folks might touch on New Zealand and such, but, and then the panel afterwards will be international. I'm just going to talk about the United States. Um, and so, you know, going back to the FOSTA-SESTA, I think that really did shift the conversation in the United States of like, okay, we, you know, we got to, we've always been fighting for decrim, right? Sex workers have always wanted decrim, sex worker activists. But I think, you know, because of FOSTA SESTA that shifted things and it was like, okay, like let's, you know, um, get into action to spe specifically carve a path towards decrim. And, um, you know, I can sort of give the lay of the land of where things are at right now. Um, so Caitlin Jay and I and some other folks um, are part of a national organization called Decriminalized Sex Work. And we uh, are certainly not the, the only ones to be fighting for decrim by any stretch, but we're the only sort of national org that is seeking to um, either support or bring together different legislative efforts, right, that are either already happening or to support, you know, the beginnings and then the follow through of uh, decrim state by state. So as probably all of you know, um, prostitution is a state law, right? And so that's, that's the rub, right, is I remember showing up at law school and being like, I'm here to decriminalize prostitution. And a, a 2L was like, you know that that means that like you have to do every single state <laughs> separately and i was like oh damn <laughs> um but you know that's that's you know our our federalist system for better or worse and we can argue both ways which is a separate conversation but um it does have to be state by state or in you know dc and the territories etc cetera, etc cetera. um we're not canada we're not new zealand right um and so what does that look like right how do we do this when we are such a big country we're such a diverse country. We're such a diverse country in terms of political views, you know? And I think that's where Caitlin's history is really interesting of like what was happening in different pockets, because that definitely brings us to today of where can we accurately, or where can we effectively make headway right now, right? That's the question. And so decriminalized sex work and many other organizations are working a lot in the Northeast right now. Um, and you know, I think there's a variety of reasons, some of which is, you know, in part, just most of us are located in New York, right? There's always been a strong sex worker activist movement in New York. Um, but also that, you know, the Northeast tends to be, while, while very sort of like religious in many ways, it also tends to be quite progressive. And so we have initiatives in New York, in Rhode Island, in New Hampshire, and Vermont. Um, and Jay maybe actually will, you know, touch very briefly on, on Vermont. Um, but, you know, just overall in all those states, what we're, what we're trying to do is to gauge the temperature, right, and see politically what can we begin to push through, right? And, and again, most of us in our org are New Yorkers um, and, you know, have been, I've been doing work in New York for many, many, many years. I'm, in, I'm a New Yorker, so I sort of have a sense, right? But in states where we're, we're relatively new, we're, you know, working with local organizations and trying to get a sense of, like, what is the local temperature, with, you know, both within the activist world and within the legislative world. And, you know, in New York, um, there is a full decrim movement. Um, we are currently not working on that. It is sort of not the right time. New York, Albany is not quite ready for that, that type of move. Um, but we are working on, well, pre-coronavirus, <laughs> um, we were working on pushing the removal of loitering for the purpose of engaging in a prostitution offense, other nine, otherwise known and, and termed as walking while trans. And we also have been working on expanding the vacature law, which vacating convictions allows survivors of human trafficking to get rid of their past criminal history. 
Um, and that's something that I personally have been working on since its inception in 2010 in New York, which was the first state to ever have vacatur. And it now exists in most states across the country. And so these are sort of, I don't want to say baby steps because that minimizes them, but they're building blocks towards full decrim, right? We're not there yet. We will be there. I have no doubt, but we don't know when. It could be 10 years. It could be 15. You know, we need, we need to sort of have realistic building blocks um, to that. And so in New York, again, there is a full decrim movement and that's great, but our organization is currently working on these sort of more building block. Um, and again, you know, everything was put on, on hold, obviously, because of coronavirus, understandably. Um, but we had a very good shot at passing both the loitering removal and the expansion of vacature. I, be I believe that both of those would have passed in New York this year if it were not before. Of course, we're all we're all living in this incredibly distorted um, and, and, and traumatic altered reality, right, because of, of coronavirus. So, so that's New York, um, Rhode Island, we're pushing for a study commission and Rhode Island, as Caitlin said, has this like incredible history and there's actually data that supports our position of decrim in Rhode Island. Um, there's also some great research being done out of Brown and by Coyote, which again is tied to this history that Caitlin touched on in Rhode Island. Um, and so we're working in Rhode Island, we're working in New Hampshire, which is right, live free or die state. Um, and so there is that libertarian perspective there. There's also quite a conservative angle there. Uh, and it's a very bizarre state. <laughs> um, not, I mean, I don't mean to offend anybody that, it, you know, maybe, but it, it is politically a fascinating place um, because you have this sort of you know, you're in the Northeast or in New England. So there's that aspect, but then there's this libertarian aspect. And then there's also this very sort of country, more rural aspect to it. Um, and so there we're pushing for immunity for sex workers to come forward, also expanding vacature, both of which again would have, I really believe would have passed in New Hampshire, if not for coronavirus. They were both sort of well on their way. Um, Vermont uh, is the most progressive of all of these places. Um, there we're working towards study commission, um, eventually full decrim um, in Vermont, which I think could, could be one of the states that pushes things through sooner rather than later, um, because you have all the progressive New England values without sort of the, the religion or the, you know, the other things that kind of, or a strong anti-trafficking movement, right, which we often have to combat, even though we're all aiming to fight exploitation, we see it, you know, our side, if you want to call it, you know, call it that, sees it as decrim is the way to fight human trafficking, right? Whereas if you're somebody that looks at it like, oh my God, these, all these poor women are being exploited and hurt and prostitution is inherently trafficking, inherently exploitative, nobody would ever choose to do it, then of course you're going to be pushing for the end demand model, which we, we also see legislative uh, initiatives in New York, right? Um, New York has a very strong anti-trafficking, very well connected, very well funded anti-trafficking network um, that has been pushing for a Nordic model bill, which was recently introduced. So we'll sort of, again, everything's on hold, but we'll see how that plays out. I don't think Albany is ready for that either, which is great. <laughs> um, but that, you know, that also has entered sort of the political fray in Albany. Um, and so that's sort of the framework. Obviously, there's, there's always fascinating things happening in Nevada, which I know Barb <laughs> will touch on, um, and Nevada being the, the legal anomaly in the United States as the only state that does not have a statewide penal code. Um, there's also, I know the next session, people will talk about the DC, uh, the, the legislation in DC that was before the city council. Um, and I believe the Denver folks are working on an initiative that I, I can't wait to hear more about. Um, and there's also some talk about initiatives in other locations. So we're really on the precipice um, in this country for radical, legislative change. Um, but we also need to acknowledge that we're sort of at the beginning of that. You know, we're, we're, we're there. We've sort of made it to the top of the hill or however you want, whatever metaphor works. But we, we you know, we have a lot more to go uh, until we're actually until we're actually there. But I think the shift has occurred to where talking about decriminalizing prostitution 
is a mainstream um, conversation. It was not, <laughs> you know, 10 years ago, even five years ago. But now, you know, now it is, you know. Uh, so it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's very exciting to see. Um, so I'm gonna hand things off to Jill. Unless there's questions, or we'll wait till the end. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jill McCracken, and thank you, Melissa. I, I've enjoyed, this has been great. Um, I'm learning a lot. I always learn a lot um, from my co-presenters, so it's, it's fun to think about how we all kind of connect in our own positionalities. Um, so for those of us who don't know me, I'm a professor at the University of South Florida in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I actually was one of the founding board members of Swap USA. So I uh, have been around as an activist advocate for a very long time. And it's interesting because I think it is important for us to think about our positions and, and how we come to these, these conversations. And I initially came, I've been working in this area doing research, came to this as primarily a researcher um, and have been doing this work for about 16 years. But one of the things that was important to me as a researcher was to give back to the community. Researchers get a lot of flack, rightly so, I believe, especially when we're working with marginalized communities because, and I apologize, there's a, a lawnmower outside my window. Anyway, if you can hear that. Um, we get a lot of flack because we come into these come into these communities, we do research, sometimes with them, sometimes on them, and then we take all that back and we get our careers and our publications and our promotions and our blah, 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 right? And that's a, that's a big problem. And one of the things that I've dedicated my research career to is community-based participatory research, where the community is at the center of the research. And also basically giving back to whatever communities I'm working most with. So I did a, uh, just for an example, in, in addition to the sex worker rights community, I did a five year study with women who were incarcerated. And I spent a lot of time volunteering and working with that organization. And I think it's really important because not only does it give to whatever that organization is, but it centers the voices in the research project. And so um, one of the things that uniquely happened to me was I met Robin Few, one of the founders of Swap USA, and early on, largely because I was willing to put my legal name on the documents, she asked me would I be a, a board member. But it, it has drastically changed my perspective in my life because I've been able to hang out, in addition to being a researcher, I've been able to hang out with all these amazing sex workers and learn from that perspective. So when Melissa talks about this perspective that many people who are just regular old people who don't get to hang out with sex workers all the time, right? Think of it in terms of, well, who could possibly choose that? Why would anyone want to do that? And so then it kind of gets us into this ideology of prostitution or sex work as being inherently exploitative, which then allows for that incredibly problematic conflation of, you know, prostitution and trafficking in the sex industry, right? And I can talk more about that if people are interested, because I know many, if you're here, you, you already know about all of these problems. Um, but I just want to acknowledge the fact that as, in addition to being a researcher, I've been an advocate. And then in 2016, um, my co-director Alex Andrews and I started Swap Behind Bars, which is a chapter of the Sex Workers Outreach Project. And we focus specifically on people who have been incarcerated for prostitution and now increasingly for trafficking, which is really incredibly problematic and I've learned so much since being a part of that organization, right? And we work primarily with people who have been um, incarcerated for prostitution and prostitution related crimes because not all of them have engaged in or have been convicted of prostitution, right? But there's a lot that go along with that. And again, that has just drastically changed my perspective since 2016. I'm sitting on mounds and mounds and mounds of data, which I desperately would love help with um, analyzing if anyone out there is, is interested in doing that perspective, right? No funding, no funding, we need funding, but you know, data. Um, because we just have so much 
information from all these people and so many letters, thousands and thousands and thousands of letters, which we're keeping all of them. And I think it's just um, going to be a goldmine of information over time and also heartbreaking, heart, heart wrenching and heartbreaking. Um, but a community for people who have disproportionately not been involved in the sex worker rights movement. So Swap Behind Bars creates community for people who are currently behind bars and were formerly behind bars who didn't even know there was a sex worker rights movement, didn't even know the term sex work, right? And so it's been really interesting to be able to inform the sex worker rights movement by gaining all of this information and knowledge from people who are incarcerated. And I, I like that overlap a lot for myself as a researcher and an advocate because I think it just brings much more richness to the movement. And one of the reasons why Alex and I wanted to start this organization and, or this chapter and its organization in its own right. Um, so that that's sort of my who I am and what I bring to this, in addition to being a social scientist researcher that I've been doing, um, I started doing research on street-based prostitution back when I was uh, getting my PhD, get, working on my graduate degree. And, um, and ever since then, I've continued by putting, trying to get people who are most at the center to actually say, what are the questions that need to be asked and what are the questions that we need to answer? So one of my dreams since when I first started doing this work back in 2003-2004 was that the idea when I found out that New Zealand had decriminalized prostitution in 2003 right they passed for those of us who may not know the Prostitution Reform Act in 2003 and they decriminalized prostitution and I have a, a slide I can I can share if people are interested that actually lays out what it the actual PRA and what it does but for time's sake um, I will say that it basically does not decriminalize anything that is related to force or trafficking, right? It requires the con that, that you use a condom for every sex act. And it actually allows, and this is directly related as we've been talking a little bit around COVID has become even more important with coronavirus. It allows for, um, because sex workers are decriminalized, it allows for them to um, file for unemployment, right? And they even made the process easier because they didn't want there to be a lot of stigma and stigma and discrimination is, is still a huge problem in New Zealand, but they didn't want there to be um, that a, a long waiting period if somebody wanted to leave the sex industry. So they made it very easy for people to apply for unemployment. And because it is a legitimate job, it's decriminalized, they can do that, right? So what one of my dreams has been since I found out that it was decriminalized there because as Melissa and Caitlin both have said, we have been advocating for decrim forever, right? Everyone has been advocating for this. And my job, my goal as a researcher was to say, okay, well, let's go where it's been decriminalized for 15 years and let's look at it and see, is this really what we all think it should be, right? Is it all really that, that great? And so I was lucky enough to get, I was awarded a Fulbright and I worked with the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective and Catherine Healy and a lot of people all over New Zealand. And in 2018, I spent three months over there um, doing research and I basically created this community based research project in collaboration with the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective and many people that were working there. <clears throat> and the, the primary question that we were asking, the primary research question that we were asking was what is the impact of decrim on violence and trafficking in the sex industry? These are burning questions for me. One of the things that I have always focused on is this idea about violence. And I think for our strategies, and this gets back to, I guess, the subject of, of, of what's at hand here, for our strategies for decrim, one of the things that I have advocated for is this idea that let's talk about violence, let's talk about amnesty, let's talk about immunity, right? Here in St. Petersburg, we just went and visited with our social, uh, social with our, um, our, our city commissioner, our county commissioner of people, city, sorry, city, not county, and asked that an amnesty law be put into place for both workers and clients, right? So this kind of small building blocks, I like what you're saying, right? Melissa, this, these building blocks to say, this is how, and I believe Barb's gonna talk a little bit more about this, how sex workers and clients can be at the forefront of fighting trafficking if there's amnesty laws, right? That's just one little tiny bit that starts to get at how can we fight all of these? Because we know that the trafficking exists, we know that it's a problem, but if people are not afraid to come forward, decrim is obviously what we want in terms of letting people advertise and engage and not be afraid of being criminalized, right? And we, I also advocate, and this is as a researcher, um, advocate for 
people being able to do what they do the work that they want to do, do the sex work or do whatever it is that they're wanting to do and not be worried about being punished and knowing that that is absolutely better advocating for people who are criminal, sorry, who are being exploited, right? So knowing that those two go hand in hand. And I think that's really important to emphasize. So I had the opportunity to go to New Zealand for three months and do this, pro do this work. And the goal here was to look at the, um, the existence of violence and trafficking. And overwhelmingly, and I have some quotes and I have some data, we interviewed 64 people, 33 of whom were current and former, no, current sex workers, 34 of whom were um, former sex workers, many of whom were still engaged, but they were basically what I'm calling people that work closely with sex workers. So they were people working at New Zealand Prostitutes Collective. They were uh, brothel managers and owners. They were doctors, medical professionals. They were all of these other people. But I would say about half of them were also former sex workers and current sex workers. Um, so there was about 60, 60, what did I say? 67 people that we talked to and had in-depth interviews and focus groups with them. And overwhelmingly, I found that the violence had decreased as a result of decriminalization, right? That you couldn't hear stories about clients. You would hear stories about clients pushing the boundaries. And we had a lot of really interesting conversations about what is violence, right? Because people define violence in very different ways. So you would, and you would hear stories about clients pushing the boundaries, but overwhelmingly sex workers knew that they had recourse if somebody was trying to push them to do something they didn't want to do, or if there was theft, or if there was some kind of physical violence that they could either go to the police or they could go to the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective who, had a, who has an incredibly excellent relationship with the police in all of these different cities and they could then advocate for them. So overwhelmingly we found that it was definitely um, helped in terms of decreasing violence, right? One of the things that I have to mention here, which I find I, I, I was jaw dropping for me, was one of the questions that I asked everyone was, do you ever experience violence at the hands of police? And people would look at me like, at the police? It, 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 would, it blew my mind, right? Because here in the US, you can't talk to a sex worker who hasn't had some kind of negative experience or here has a close friend who has a negative experience or been directly exploited by police, right? And we have researchers and evidence-based in, information out there that shows that police by far cause some of the most egregious problems for youth and for sex workers and people who are marginalized and people of color. So to hear again and again and again, people actively looking confused that police would be causing the violence was, was beautiful. And also just, I was incredulous, right? So that was something, and I'm gonna be writing that up because I think it's really, really important to get that, to get that out there, that they saw the police, the street-based workers would be like, the cops drive by every so often and they're like, hey, how's it going? Have you seen Mindy? Haven't seen Mindy lately. Oh no, Mindy was over here. Okay, great, sounds good, everything's good. As a protective, as they should be, right? Isn't that interesting? As a protective source in our lives, right? So, um, I just wanted to touch briefly on that research. I also wanted to touch briefly on what we've learned. Melissa talked a little bit about the vacature laws and what, through our work with Swap Behind Bars, and I think this is where these intersections come together. When we think about amnesty, when we think about looking at evidence-based studies, there are many that have been done in New Zealand. Mine is just one um, that talks about what does this actually look like on the ground and trying to encourage our legislators to look at evidence-based studies, to to listen to the people who are most directly impacted, right? Um, and so the other thing that I wanna talk about briefly in my time, which I have not been keeping track of my time, um, is this idea about vacature laws in the sense that basically what I feel like it, it, with Swap Behind Bars, we got to work very closely with Kate Mogulescu, who started in instituting some vacature laws and some clemency cases for some of the people that have been, that are currently incarcerated for trafficking. So they have been convicted of trafficking other people when they were actually victims of trafficking themselves. And the last time I talked with Kate, which was quite a bit ago, um, several months ago, you know, I think there were six or seven clemency cases that they've drawn up and they are continually getting by word of mouth through several prisons here in Florida in particular, word of mouth that they're saying, you know, 
uh, this happened to me. I was a victim of trafficking and then I got convicted of trafficking. So we're seeing this overlap of the fact that people who have been victimized are actually now being convicted and now they're going to have their names on the registry, the you know sex offender registry for the rest of their lives, can't get into halfway houses. Like all of these other problems that we see and emphasizing the problems that we see with criminalization and not allowing people to basically engage in mainstream living or mainstream employment because of all of their you know, convictions, right? But I think emphasizing this idea that we've got all these laws on the book that are harming people and then we have to vacate them later. We have to go through all of this time and energy and trouble to vacate the prostitution charges that are on their record. I think that can be an important point, and that's what I'm always constantly trying to do is think about strategically, how can we help lay people understand why prostitution so desperately needs to be decriminalized? How can we look at it? And so if we look at it like from these vacature laws, from the fact that as Melissa said, you know, or maybe it was Caitlin, sorry, the drug laws disproportionately affect marginalized communities. The prostitution laws disproportionately affect, as we know, all of these communities. So to try to, to express to the lay people who don't know any of this, that the laws are disproportionately impacting people and they're causing greater harm and they're actually increasing people's inability to get out of exploitative situations, right? So we see that again and again with spot behind bars. And we don't see that, again, my, my research was limited in New Zealand, but we don't see that because people can, if there's an exploitative situation, there's issues with language barriers and, and being a migrant and there are challenges to the New Zealand model. Um, it's not utopic, so to speak, but there are ways that people can go and get help and get assistance if they're facing some kind of exploitative conditions, right? So I think I will end there for now, um, but I'm happy to talk more about any of those things when we come up with uh, questions. And who am I turning it over to? Oh my God, I totally forgot. I'm turning it over to Jay Lee. <laughs> Hey, um, I actually didn't know what my um, time limit was. So, um, Barb, can you tell me that? Or 10? I'm seeing 10. Okay, 10 it is. Um, right at noon. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Lee Brantley. Um, and I am. Oh, it's always weird when you want to describe yourself. Um, I kind of work in a lot of different intersectional places. Um, in sex work, um, and I think that re reflects my experience um, personally, um, having intersectional identities, and then um, also my like professional curiosities and academic curiosities. Um, so I'm very new in my research um, career. I'm like I'm a little hesitant to even call it that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. <laughs> Jill would encourage that. Um, I have worked with a lot of these folks in the past, and um, have worked with mostly community scenarios um, regarding sex workers. I am a longtime sex worker um, myself and have been, you know, just really, I think, really honored to be able to work with some amazing people. Um, so I just kind of want to shout that out right now. I, I think that we don't always take time to give ourselves a little but I just want to say to people who are on this panel, I'm just really honored to to know all of you and to have worked with you mostly Barb. I'm coming for you. Gonna gonna analyze some data for you one of these days, and Jill. Um, but yeah, I'm just really honored to um, you know be able to to work with everyone um, because this is really important work. It's very good work. It's very hard work. It's very challenging work, but it's it's profoundly important. So um, yeah, my my background is um, mostly in performance before uh, I was a sex worker and filmmaking. And um, my degree is in communication arts. I went to film school. I worked in the Hollywood system for a while and I'm really interested um, in the intersection of filmmaking with um, research. And so that's kind of my angle as I'm shopping around graduate schools right now. Um, I was actually supposed to start in London under an, an, uh, the head researcher for Sexcume, which is what I'll, what I'll talk about a little bit. Um, then coronavirus happened and here we are. So. Uh, <laughs> it's a wild time, as most would say. Um, so I, I had the privilege of being able to work on the sexual humanitarianism, is what it's called, sex team for short, International Ethnographic Research Project. 
um, under um, Nick Mai, who's a fantastic researcher and also an advocate that we've all worked with in various capacities. Um, that's looking at uh, migration patterns in sex workers. So this was, you know, an international study in scope, and um, I got to work on the filmmaking aspect of um, the New York-based uh, project, which was very much community-based participatory research. Participatory research that Jill was alluding to. You know, there is a movement of researchers like herself that are really making a concerted effort, um, and others too, I'm sure Barb as well, like it's great, um, that are really making an intentional effort to work with communities and not work at communities or on communities, as, as you said. Um, and I think that that's really key, right, when we're trying to sort of um, acknowledge harms that have been done in the research community towards marginalized communities in general. Um, and so I, I'm really grateful for that, and I see so much collaboration, you know, um, as we are the experts of our own lives, right? Um, and so that's really heartening. Um, this particular aspect of sexual humanitarianism, sexium, um, was called, the film is called Cayer, and, and that was also made in conjunction with a group of trans-Latina women, um, mostly in Jackson Heights that are um, current and former sex workers. And that, that research project, ultimately the film, was made um, in conjunction with them. They were part of the screenwriting process. They were actors portraying themselves. And, 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 um, and that's kind of a, um, you know, that's kind of a, a, a typical aspect of, of this particular type of uh, ethnography and um, ethnofiction. So, um, it was fantastic and to work on that set as well. And I ended up even actually being in the film myself, which is kind of wild to play a police officer that was arresting other sex workers. <laughs> uh, a little meta. Um, and, and of course that is, you know, that's part of it, right? This kind of intersection of creativity and in the form of filmmaking um, with research and how do we see ourselves? How are we portraying ourselves? You know, um, so that was really fascinating, and I and I really enjoy being able to work on that. Um, I just wanted to take a moment, um, at being able to be one of the producers on that project. One of the pro producers um, of that project uh, is um, was a woman named Lorena Borjas, who we who passed away um, this spring uh, of COVID nineteen related illness. So I just wanted to take a moment to say that we lost an amazing activist and mother to the community, particularly um, for for the LGBT community, um, the Latin American community, and Latinx community in, in the United States, but mostly in New York. Um, these laws that Melissa, you know, talked about, um, the walking while tra trans laws, we found they overwhelmingly target, you know, um, trans women of color, particularly those that are in a small uh, aspect of Queens and Brooklyn, uh, Jackson Heights, and in parts of Bushwick, Brooklyn, New York. So, these are very um, problematic laws um, and for multiple reasons. Uh, I also want to uh, mention too that I, I, I'm, I, I call myself a organizer because I sort of work with everyone. And I also work on um, you know, boards for GLIT, Gays and Lesbians Living in Transgender Society, which is doing like boots on the ground work of bringing people um, who have been out of, incarcerated um, in Rikers and other places in New York um, and I think New Jersey as well. And they are working with folks to, to make sure they are safe in the time of COVID and giving them housing and food and these things. So that's a fantastic organization um, that, that, that we work with. SOAR Institute, of course, is um, Melissa's organization, um, which is wonderful. And they work with survivors of trafficking uh, as well as sex workers on policy advocacy. So um, on those boards, and I also, you know, work with Duke Sex Work as their projects and research manager, um, and New York Transgender Advocacy Group as well. We are doing um, a project with NITAG, New York Trans Transgender Advocacy Group, um, that is focused on bringing relief to TGNC and B sex workers right now. And so um, they're small, you know, grants and gift, gift card support. So if anybody wants to donate, that's a great way to put your money, going to trans sex workers that are out of work. Um, I personally have lost, you know, all of my sex work clients as a result of this because being an in-person provider, um, which has been tough. 
and uh, but there are people who have it a lot worse than I do. So you know that's sort of what we're dealing with right now in this kind of crazy time. Um, all recently, and in the last couple of weeks, I have actually um, co-founded and am the co-director of a new organization in Vermont. And um, Alex Sanders, who Jill talked about before, who is uh, you know the head of uh, Project Prosper, who that's an organization that really sponsors a lot of these uh, national sex worker rights um, organizations. So they are our um, fiscal sponsor as well, Thor Institute and Glitz and many others, Swapi Heinbars. Um, and, you know, we are the only, as we know of, organization um, run by and for um, sex workers in the state of Vermont. And so that's very new. We'll be having our virtual launch for anybody who wants to watch some fun silly uh, and probably great music from Vermont um, musicians will be launching our organization. We are uniquely, um, I think, positioned uh, for folks that are, you know, sort of working in these states to, to influence legislation and to influence the laws that are moving us forward towards decriminalization. Um, in Vermont, you know, we had some fantastic traction on the study commission bill that was really looking at their profoundly antiquated prostitution, prostitution laws, which are also actually tied into just sexual activity laws, which many of these are, right? So they're not talking about just the commercialization of sexual activity. The language is even in tied into just people's sexual behavior, judgments on, on, on what is sort of loose, you know, morals, right? You know, folks that are having difficulty right now applying for the SBA loans, right? Those are, is the SBA, right? I'm, my acronyms, so many acronyms, y'all. So many acronyms. Uh, uh, they are having difficulty, a lot of sex workers that are, you know, applying for this because of the prurient interest clause, uh, you know, which is a judgment on prurient's excessive interest in sexuality. Right, so, you know, I'm, I think, you know, as a, 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 a rhetoric, <laughs> uh, expert at Joe, I'm always curious <laughs> your take on these things because it's like, uh, where are they pulling these things out? You know, it's, it's almost like people don't even have access to dictionaries when they're writing these laws because of the broad strokes that can be interpreted. And we see that in Dustin Foss and all these kinds of things. So, um, yeah, it's just a side note. Um, we, we in Vermont are, are, are launching and really very intentionally positioning ourselves as um, anti-trafficking organizations. Um, and, and, and that's what decriminalization does, right? It fights trafficking inherently. When you don't have criminality to hold over someone, someone's head, right? Um, your ability to control their behavior and influence their behavior is removed. I don't know if anybody's, everybody's seen the Jeffrey Epstein, uh, you know, special on Netflix that just came out. Holy mother. You want to talk about being, you, you know, um, you know, trafficking, conflation of sex work. You know, you have like minors that are, that were grotesquely treated. Sorry, I'm trying to talk about it. Is, um, these minors were horrifically treated by law enforcement and you can see it in the videos and some of those episodes. You do realize you're implicating yourself in a serious crime here. I mean, this is not the way that we treat, you know, minors that are being trafficked. And yet the law holds law enforcement in this very precarious situation. And that's me being generous, right? Assuming that they're actually seeing folks as survivors, right? Sometimes they don't. And so, you know, I think that the more that, in my view, the password decriminalization is aligned with us being the absolute experts of our industry to fight exploitation, to prevent exploitation, the more that we present ourselves as the people that we don't need a seat at that table, that is our table. Everyone else here that's coming in to rescue this industry, they have you know, been squatting on our land, right? That is our land, this is our industry. I can't imagine another industry where the folks who were working in the industry uh, you know, had to sort of beg to be at the table, right, to, pr to make sure that everybody was having their rights. But that's very unique to the sex industry. We're sort of being like, oh, we hope we get to be there at this anti-trafficking, you know, conference. We hope we don't, you know, make too much noise. And that's just bizarre. I mean, their agriculture is the same way. The folks that are fighting agricultural trafficking are people who are working in the agricultural industry, 
So I, I think that we have to, you know, stop being timid that we are belong at this, these tables, right? And that's my, my feeling of, 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 of how we can move towards decriminalization state by state and, and municipality by municipality, is we have to kick these doors open because we can't allow for people to close these doors for us anymore because it's our house. It's our house, our table, you know? So anyway, that's the attitude of the man to step down and I'm gonna step back. Am I, am I throwing to, to Barb? Is that what we're doing? We're tossing? Yes, I had to find my unmute button here. Um, uh, so thank you. I am a, a really honored to be in a table of people doing so much good stuff. I'm uh, Barb Brent, I'm a professor at uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and I've just been doing research um, primarily uh, on Nevada brothel industry with Kate, who I think is in the audience there, um, uh, back when nobody was doing much research on that at all from any kind of uh, progressive perspective. Um, and uh, I, I, I have a long way to go to give back to the people that I study um, in the ways that these folks do, but I, they're, they're, uh, I'm working towards it. Um, but just but i want to talk really briefly about two things what's going on in nevada uh and then two is a little bit of what i learned from uh the research that we've done on clients and i'll talk about that in a minute um on in nevada as you all know nevada has uh, legal prostitution in 10 of uh eh, how many counties i don't know it, it's a, it's about half the counties in Nevada. Most of them are rural. They're small brothels. It's legalized, in, which means, and that was that's the only form of prostitution that can legally exist is within the brothels. Um, and I can go into the details of how that works if you want. But what's been uh, interesting to me in the last several years has been that the well, working women, and it's predominantly women, there are a couple of trans folks working in some of the brothels, um, uh, but no men, cis or uh, male presenting, um, uh, that the women are starting to come out and speak. Uh, and I, I think I talked last year about, um, there is a, a brothel study committee that's being, that was being formed in the legislature, which only happens once every two years. Uh, and sex workers, both, from local sex worker rights organizations amongst where it's criminalized in urban areas came forward as well as brothel workers and it was really just heartening to see uh, that and I think that has increased over the last um, year or so uh, and um, while Nevada is seen as the evil entity we for we we do not want just to legalize it in the way nevada did um and that's for sure i think that uh because there's that entry point of sex workers who are legal somewhere in the u.s uh it allows the opportunity to say hey um maybe it can work maybe there are sex workers that are professional and you know politics of uh, of uh, you know class and all that respectability but uh, they uh, I think that there's something to learn the other thing I think is the focus inward on Nevada brothels and how to make them more uh, accountable and better for the workers uh, the workers in the brothels are independent contractors independent contractors in the state and nationally are treated like crap uh the laws are ambiguous for all of them and i yeah so uh there's an opportunity at that level to to work on independent contractor law that i think can help a lot of currently legal sex workers dancing or, or porn or whatever uh, and uh, that, that affects there, there's an opportunity for collaboration at that level as well but i'm not seeing too much of that happen because you're also fighting big business um uh but the brothel owners at least in the state are supportive of this kind of change and of course um 
there there was an attempt recently there is a, a lockdown in, that happens in some places whereby workers are confined to the brothels, uh, which are, you know, as I said, mostly out in the middle of nowhere and are not allowed to leave except supervised or, um, or you know, it's precarious. You can go, but, you know, we don't want to see them in respectable places. Uh, and they were called out for this and there was an attempt to actually strengthen that law in uh, Pahrump, uh, in uh, Nye County, and sex workers and other uh, activists came out and said, no, 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 that's the wrong direction to go. Um, and so they defeated that, so that was, that was good. Um, <laughs> there, uh, so there's a lot of opportunity in Nevada, of course, the coronavirus has like cut everything down uh, a great deal. Um, but one positive thing that it's done is that there are a number of sex workers who have gotten unemployment uh, insurance. Now, it hadn't been easy because gig work, it's, it's mostly state laws mm -hmm. and gig workers are subject to uh, the state unemployment systems and unemployment systems are not set up for gig workers and independent contractors. Um, so there's been a lot of work that had to have been done by uh, in, by the employment, you know, bureaucracies in the state, but they are now getting them like other, getting unemployment like other sex workers, uh, other gig workers. So that's a good thing. And that's kind of a, a model and another potential entry point in the future. I think we can try and uh, do some uh, work. Um, uh, also, uh, there are a number of sex workers because they are legal. Uh, they're able to say, hey, here's how I set up my finances. And of course, this is a class-based issue, but here's how I become a corporation for myself and pay myself in employment insurance. And, and, and there are lots of things that with resources they are able to do because they're legal, but they can also say they're sex workers. So um, they can be used as examples uh, uh, and, and, and they can, um, I think their situations, they, the power, that, the resources that they have by virtue of class uh, and other privileges they have allow them some rights that I think uh, would have otherwise been not available just because they were illegal on top of all that. Um, so obviously we have a long way to go because as, as all the previous panelists have said, it's really the minoritized workers and uh, uh, immigrants and other and, and, and trans and other groups that are most disproportionately affected. And that's certainly the case in Nevada, the brothels tend to be sort of racist and, and places uh, and only the most privileged and resource workers can actually work there. Um, uh, so bracket all that, you know, now don't bracket all that, but uh, I think there's there's potential in the Nevada system to do some things. The other thing I want to say about Nevada really quickly is that uh, we are also working on a bill with some sex workers and have a, uh, um, a legislature and a lawyer helping us on a safe harbor safe harbor for victims of trafficking proposal, which is a, an immunity bill like these folks were talking about. And I'm hoping that that's gonna gain some traction in the next legislature. Um, the other thing finally I wanna quickly talk about is uh, that um, uh, we, I, I recently completed a fairly large survey of clients in the United States. Of course, it's not a random sample uh, because we can never access all the clients, um, but it's, it was pretty large scale. There was about 800 folks in our survey. And then I collaborated with Tila Sanders, who did a large survey, about 1,200 clients in the UK, mostly that did online workers. And we have a book. Uh, that we just completed um, on paying for sex in the digital age, which is really kind of a, a summary of the findings from this research. And there's a lot of data that we have that just needs to be mined. Uh, and, um, and I'll be talking about this more in a session later this afternoon. 
But one thing that became very clear in this is that clients are willing to come forward and speak out when they encounter instances where they think people are being trafficked or exploited and would love to. And in the UK, there is some number to call and I, a few clients indicated that they called that number, um, uh, I, I, I believe I'm blanking on the name of the, um, they have a group that monitors violence and, and, and bad dates, um, but they contacted them and they don't know what happened to it. I think there's some police line you could call and they don't know what happened to it, but for the most part, they're afraid to do that because they don't want to come out and be seen as clients themselves. I mean, see, seen as traffickers themselves. Um, so there's an opportunity there to get clients to us get them to assist uh, uh, fighting trafficking and exploitation. There's also, a lot of them talked about these review sites, which, you know, people have a love-hate relationship with those if you're a sex worker, um, and they can be very sexist and nasty and, and harmful. However, uh, there are some uh, platforms in the UK where it's not, they're not subject to the FOSTA-SESTA laws, which has cut all that out for the US. There are uh, some platforms that are giving sex workers ways to rate clients. There, there are, are ways in which sex workers can, can share information on clients on, on these review boards. And there are a lot of clients who say, I'm really fed up with that, you know, sexism. Some will say, oh, I've called people out, uh, and others are, oh, I'm too shy to, but on some platforms, they give them better opportunities to do that. So there is an opportunity to uh, e educate the, um, the culture of clients. Uh, they already talk to each other about, uh, this, is, this is how you start off. This is how you become a, become a client. And there's really an opportunity to uh, develop that a whole lot more than we have to sort of shift uh, those clients who are trying to push the boundaries too much and make them outliers and, and have them police themselves. So that I think is a, another um, opportunity that we can use. And with that, I'll stop uh, and open it up to the floor for questions. Thank you, National Ugly Mugs. Yes, that was the organization in the UK. Um, uh, I'll open it up to the floor for question and answer. You can type in the chat bar or you can raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you. We can chat with each other and ask each other questions as, as well. I have a quick um, um, question, comment kind of a thing. Um, Bob, can we if anyone so since this session is being recorded if anyone doesn't want to be recorded you can still ask questions just send bob a private message through your the chat option at the bottom you can select just to send it to bob and then bob you can pause the at the time when the person is speaking who doesn't want to be recorded and then we can go back is that okay so that you know everyone has a chance to ask question you don't have to be shy you know staying away from sorry hope i'm making sense i'm just okay good uh, can i ask the first question too <laughs> um, <laughs> melissa um can you explain a little bit more about uh the vacature um, laws um and also I was, so that's a more technical thing. And then more on a broader sense, um, thinking more from a sociological point of view or a socio-legal aspect, I'm really curious. And I don't know if there is an answer for this. And again, this is like for open for everybody to jump in. Um, what is with the Northeast for you? I mean, I think most of you all kind of indicated that you have some, so, my background is Canadian. Most of my work is done in Canada. I just moved to the US. I'll be starting work in the US, super excited. Um, but the, the, the sense that I'm getting is the Northeast 
seems to be progressive, a little bit more easier to making ways for decrim. There is possibilities, opportunities, all these kinds of things compared to probably the South. Um, and I think the West is also a little bit more progressive. So I'm more specific about the East, Northeast. What is, like sociologically, if you can locate any events or aspects, and maybe even Caitlin, if you can throw in some historical points that is giving us, like what happened then that's giving us this opportunity now. Do you know what I mean? Like it seems yeah. like you're making a lot of headway. So I would like to see what is like sociologically, you know, too early for me. That's fine. Yeah, Melissa, do you want me to take this a little bit first or do you want to jump sure. in? Sure, should I answer the vacatur question first yeah. or should we go? Okay, we'll do vacatur first and then I'll kick it to Caitlin talk about the lay of the land, and then I'm happy to also add to it or anyone else to add to it, because, um, yeah, I think there's a lot there. So in terms of vacature, New York was the first state in the country to have a vacating convictions law in 2010. Um, and we, I filed the first motion, I was with the Sex Workers Project then, uh, where I worked for a long time, and we already had a motion in progress for a client uh, who's a victim of trafficking. Um, and we sort of, once that law was passed, we were able to sort of just like get it in. Uh, this was in Queens where there was already a human trafficking intervention court, which there now is in every borough, but, but it just worked out that there was a judge that had an expertise on human trafficking in Queens. Um, and so uh, sort of we were able to sort of harness the change in the law in New York State and the momentum around human trafficking and this particular court's expertise to sort of develop the initial case law in the country for vacating convictions. The, um, now in terms of, and, and you know, thinking back to 10 years ago, I know that vacature was somewhat controversial within the sex worker world. Um, because it's this very sort of small remedy, right? I, I always see things as, for me, I'm a lawyer first and an activist second, even though I've been an activist longer, but I'm always gonna look at things through a, a lawyer lens, right? If it's gonna help one client, to me, that's reason enough, right? But from an advocacy and activist lens, people were see, saying, wait a minute, we don't wanna carve out a law that says you have to be a good type of sex worker. Like you have to be this poor little victim to get your record cleared. And I get that. I fully get that from an activist perspective, but as a lawyer who was representing survivors of trafficking um, at the time, now I'm doing more policy work, but you know, it's like, hey, if you can help just one person, I mean, of course it's many more than one. Um, it's thousands and thousands and thousands across the country, dozens of thousands, if not, um, yeah, we don't know the exact number, but you know, then it's worth it. And that could pave the way towards full decrim, right? When we're realizing like, this is ridiculous that people have this on their record, regardless of how or why they were in the industry. So that's sort of the origin of vacature and maybe some of the political background around vacature as it fits into larger uh, decrim. And now most states in the country have, have vacature laws. We're also hoping to have a federal vacature law, especially around, I know, People touched on Jill. You mentioned Kate Mogulescu is doing, um, you know, bigger, you know, sort of federal, you know, clemency because we don't have vacature on a federal level when people are, are charged and convicted of human trafficking, which a lot of survivors are. So I'll kick it to Caitlin to give sort of the framework around the the United States. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I think it's appropriate that we sort of started our history with the. Uh, history of the U.S. like from the Civil War and I think that like sort of a north-south divide is uh, absolutely a way of thinking about regionalism in the U.S. but I think it's more useful to think about an urban-rural divide in terms of the lived experience um, of both sex workers and their communities and I think that one of the things that made the Northeast um, more progressive is industrialization and urbanization um, in it, it rather than sort of like lack of racism, uh, because racism was everywhere before the Civil War. Uh, even Lincoln was racist. So, uh, but when you talk about cities and the dynamic, uh, they're they're all they're absolutely 
rural sex workers. Uh, sex work is everywhere. But when you talk about urbanism, you allow for the idea of interaction and shared space that is so important for uh, sharing ideas and doing organizing. So if you look at places with strong labor movements or you look at places with like strong, strong uh, immigrant communities, uh, communities that are able to advocate for themselves with local government, you are often talking about places that sex workers are able to infiltrate or be a part of the communities in those places, you know? So, um, and that's one of the examples. And then another complicating factor to US history that has really shifted um, the way that sex workers um, advocate for themselves and take up space in communities is uh, the, the, West, the way that the United States um, expanded West. So, uh, you know, it is, you know, quite U.S. history, uh, before the Revolutionary War, colonists came over uh, on the East Coast, mostly, um, and then, uh, you know, we, we won the Civil War against the British, and then there was, like, the Louisiana pur Purchase with Thomas Jefferson, and, like, white people were just, like, moving further, further west. Like, first it was smallpox, and then we would, uh, we would push into territory, usually, like, white settlers would push into territory, um, against the U.S.'s stated legal wishes, and then later uh, the U.S. Army would come um, and sort of like finish off the slaughter, essentially, is the way that we expanded westward. Um, but that kind of, the, 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 that kind of genocide, and specifically the gold rush in the early or the mid-1800s, created um, a sex dynamic that led to an economic situation that sex workers were really able to take advantage of because most of the westward expansion was male laborers, right? It started with indentured servants, but then it sort of went on to uh, all kinds of laborers that like, you know, built the railroads or were working at mining camps and lumber camps and then later uh, looking for gold. And so you have cities that have like 70 to one male to female dynamics, right? San Francisco in 1840, or uh, like seven years before it became ratified as an official city had a 70 to one male to female re relationship, which means that sex workers would come in uh, to, to, for lack of a better word, meet this demand. And so rather than the, the more established um, economies and communities of the East Coast, madams, brothel owners, became some of the largest landowners in a lot of these western towns that, and it was only later that like the church came. Um, so you have a period of time, like there are a lot of western um, uh, states like Wisconsin that gave women the right to vote decades before 1920 because women had so much uh, economic and social power because there were so few of them in a lot of these these western towns and San Francisco is a really good uh, example of that because um, it co it combines sort of like the urbanism and the the, the western ethos um, whereas like East Coast it's more about sort of established elites who are trying to maintain their elite status whereas like in the the, the wild west uh, idea you have uh you have women exercising more power because it's like harder to control people that are further away in like 1890 um but in terms of like north south and like agrarian uh slave-based culture versus the uh urban sort of like worker uh based culture sex work occupies a, a different space you know it's um yeah yeah, like different different cultural spaces. So like the the Bible Belt of the South and the the like the the church culture of the North are very different um, in meaningful ways. But when you talk about Western expansion, yeah. I think it's important to understand this history of like brothel owners and sex workers executing uh, like both freedom and power in some of these like Western states um, and the way that they were they were able to establish a community there. So, but I don't. Caitlin. I don't Yes. Can I, I, like, you literally just hit the sentence that I was going to expand upon yes. about the, in, my viewpoints on this are the, the religious, the form of religious um, experience in the North versus the South, particularly when we're talking about Christianity. 
So the evangelical Protestant flavor of um, Western expansion and 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 all the like um, the various sects of evangelical branches of Christianity um, are look very different in in the South now than they do in the North. Whereas you have a lot more of cultural diversity, you have a lot more religious diversity and less emphasis on um, um, morality intersection with devoutness. So like in, in, and I can say this because I'm from the South, I grew up in like highly religious communities. I've studied religion for a very, very, very long time. Um, and particularly uh, evangelical wings of, of Christianity. So one of the things that you have is this extreme like um, fusing of, of, of morality-based judgment with dev devoutness. Whereas you, I don't see that as much in the Northeast. You have a lot of people that you will never know are religious that you meet in the Northeast, but you won't, because it seems to be much more separate from a person's life. Whereas um, religious interaction seems to be a lot more tied into someone's overall life. Like you, you, you'll see people praying in public. You'll see people um, expressing their religious devoutness in more public ways down South than you will in the North oh, by and large in my experience. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why we tend to do more work in the Northeast is because there is much more of a kind of a separation of a person's private and personal life. And I think that there, that separation also lends itself towards the political ramifications of that. Whereas the morality based stuff where you have it, you, it's very much more difficult for a person to claim to be extremely religiously devout um, in the South and then and then also, you know, support sort of progressive idealism. That's, that's more of an anom anom anomaly in the South, whereas mm -hmm. you could have people that are more religious, but they could be highly progressive in their politics. And that's not sort of a cognitive dissonance that I think that happens a lot in parts of the South. That's my take on it. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. it's, it's impossible to overstate the impact of the Christian church on American history. You know, there was a huge movement in the 1870s to establish the U.S. as a Christian nation, as there was earlier in the 1780s, like is it like from our founding forward, there has been a faction uh, in the United States trying to explicitly establish the United States as a Christian nation, and this, uh, you know, that those ideas kind of kind of shape shift. I think we see a lot of them in like the moral majority of today. Uh, but there are lots and lots of legislators uh, sitting in state houses and also at the federal level that think of ourselves, that think of the United States as a, as a Christian country. And I think that a lot of the morality laws that we see from the 1870s onward have been like efforts to sort of both like placate uh, and, um, and, and cater to that ongoing faction. And I think it, it manifests differently in the North and the South. I think that a lot of the, a lot of the Southern church, um, the white Southern church was very grounded in justifying slavery and uh, white male violence against minority communities. So a lot of it, again, as we, we covered, is sort of couched in this sort of like protecting uh, white women and that's like the form of the, the the cavalry sort of form of Christianity and I think in the Northeast you have a lot of pro-capitalist uh, Christianity sort of justifying um, the exploitation uh, of labor and then also uh, uh, um, what we covered I think really beautifully in this talk from many many different angles is sort of the the more malicious form of charity right the let me let me help you poor creature um, is a lot of the the morality, especially centered in in urban areas. Um, so it's different, and also it's the same. I had a question, kind of if if um, unless somebody else wants to answer and ask another one. Um, to those of you sort of working at the front lines with legislatures, uh, what 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 is working? I mean. Do, do you, is it is it a particular frame that you're using that that seems to be convincing unconvinced otherwise unconvinced people or do you start with allies 
I guess I want to know kind of what frames work and recognizing that um, there's two levels that the movement always has to be focused on. One is what's going to convince people within their little world uh, who have power and also critiquing the whole system that that always has to happen at the same time. But I'm curious at that level of, of resonating with the powerful what what do you what are you finding that works best what I'm, are you using i'm happy to take a a stab at that um i think it is so dependent on the jurisdiction almost targeting you know talking about why we're working in certain places to bring it to sort of like a more just pragmatic level right mm -hmm. um most of us in decriminalized sex work are, are based in new york um and you know, there's, we have connections, I mean, all over the country, but it, you know, within the Northeast, within California. Um, and so that's where a lot of the sex worker activist world is. And so I think because of that, the tactic that we take with legislators is very specific to the locale, right? In New York, for example, you know, um, Albany moves very slowly. You know, it's, it is, you know, New York, we think those of us, like I live in Brooklyn, I think that like Brooklyn is the center of the earth. It's not, you know, like we got a whole upstate in Manhattan. New York. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> nobody lives in Manhattan anymore. Okay. Um, but you know, we have a whole, you know, it is, New York is not a monolith, right? And um, senators and, and assembly people from Long Island, from upstate, right, tend to be moderate. It might be Democrats, but incredibly moderate. And so I think the framing is we've, we've been very specific and very targeted rather than just showing up and like with a hammer and being like, fuck this shit, burn it all down. We want decrim tomorrow, which there's, a, there's totally a time and place for that tactic yeah. you know um it you know it's not my tactic but i respect it you know mm -hmm. like I, you know um but it's 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 much more of like a fine-tuned instrument right it's like okay on this particular bill we need to really convince like for vacature we had an entire day up in albany this winter before coronavirus um targeting long island senators that was our only goal, was we're going to meet with Long Island senators. We have all the New York City folks. They're fully happy to expand vacature. Yes, all the DAs, they're all on it. We need the Long Island people who are getting calls daily because their constituents are pissed off about bail reform last legislative session, right? So they're seeing this tremendous more conservative backlash. So we, it's, so I guess that example shows that it has to be a really fine tuned instrument of like, what is the law you're trying to pass and who are you trying to influence and what is, what is the goal? And in that particular instance with vacatur, looking towards Long Island, it's like, if we could have gotten some of the key DAs in Long Island, we didn't yet, but if we can, then we could probably get DASNI, the DA Association of, of um, District Attorneys. And if they argue, if they even, you know, very benignly support it, like, you know, um, I mean, them saying nothing is great, but them saying something even maybe remotely positive um, or saying we won't block this would, would be key. So again, it's it's su it's such a fine-tuned instrument depending on the state and depending on the law and depending on who we're trying to target and to what what end. Can I, I wanna jump in there on uh, on a more meta level, because like Melissa's absolutely right in terms, like so much of the game of winning these states is both figuring out which factions of legislators are winnable and and how to win them. And it's it's so much a relationship game, right? Of like figuring out who to convince to convince who, but, um, We've, we've all spent a lot of time at different conferences talking to different kinds of legislators. And I think that um, it, I always approach it by trying to figure out what they already support, right? So, I mean, if you're talking to somebody that understands that we need to be decarcerating and supports LGBT rights, like they're probably with you on these issues, right? You, like you frame this as sexual freedom issue, uh, the way that, uh, you know, we're targeting these, these marginalized communities and people just get it. 
But if you're, there are ways to win law and order Republicans, right? There are like pro soccer mom arguments that you can be making in this space. And that's one of the things that we as an explicitly, you know, we're, we're trying to be mainstream, right? We're a national organization that is trying to decriminalize sex work. And so we are trying to appeal to a really broad political spectrum of folks. Our, you know, our, our uh, I want to say tagline, but that's not the right phrase. But, you know, we are trying to promote, we are first and foremost an anti-trafficking organization, and we are trying to promote health and safety, right? That that's what we're all about. And so it's easy for us because of the incredible research that folks like, you know, Jill McCracken and Barbara Brents and, and G. Lee is doing, like, we have good data that decriminalizing sex work actually promotes health and safety. But like when I was talking to a federal prosecutor at a very conservative conference last year, I used, uh, you know, the example um, that Jill brought up that in New Zealand, sex workers report criminals to the police, right? So I know that I'm talking to somebody who thinks of himself as being one of the good guys, right? He thinks of police officers as being a force of social good, but he can understand that criminalizing a group of folks, right? He's like not with us on immigrants yet, but like because, because of his chauvinism, right? Because of, he's bought into this idea of, you know, the, the, the victim narrative, then it's easy to explain to him as a prosecutor that when you decriminalize sex work, you free up people to report the real criminals. So that's a paradigm that I personally don't believe in, but that when I'm talking to a federal prosecutor that might be with us on these issues, I'm happy to use that framing to get him to where we're at. So now we have a federal prosecutor that's able to talk to his peers about what we know prohibition does to markets. That's another example that like conservative legislators love. Like conservative legislators all over America understand why criminalizing alcohol was a bad and dumb idea, right? And they like worship at the altar of this like country music bootlegger culture or whatever. And so that's another great entryway for somebody to understand, like, you know, bootleggers didn't want to decriminalize alcohol, right? So like when people are like, oh, the pimps, right? I don't challenge them on the, the racist origin of their language or how they've gotten a thousand and one complicated details wrong. I'm like, okay, let's accept the premise that pimps exist, fine, cool. But like, you get how they benefit from the fact that this is a black market, right? And so that, that's another way of coming at it where you, you can, like, this is one of those, those issues, like we're just so right. And the documentation is like, is so intense. It's like, pick an angle. It doesn't matter why these legislators are with us on these issues, only that they are, right? And so, uh, and because of the, the kind of legal strategy that we're pursuing, we have a lot of, there are a lot of legislators in New Hampshire that do not support the decriminalization of sex work. They think it's evil, but they absolutely support our immunity bills and our vacature bills and all of the other ways. And because of that, they're getting a lot of face time with sex worker advocates and activists in New Hampshire so that it, where they're building relationships and they're working on things together and focusing on the stuff that they agree with. So two, three years from now, when we do another legislative session, we can lean more heavily on those personal relationships. Maybe we'll get them there. But it's a matter of trying to, trying to frame the argument for the audience that you have in mind rather than speaking to people that are outside of, of the room, you know? Um, so that's... That's my two cents on that. Spot on. The, that metaphor that both of y'all, like, I completely agree with it. The hammer versus the scalpel that Melissa was talking about, they're all tools. And they have different places to be the most effective and useful, right? And this idea of what Caitlin said of aligning with people, what people already agree with is, is key. Whether it's LGBTQ issues, whether it's like, you know, one of the arguments I work also in trans rights as well one of the arguments that we make when we're talking to highly conservative people is like, you know, issues that, that trans people have with, you know, recognizing their gender identity and pronouns, that's actually problematic for police officers. So one of the, 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 the tools for a police officer is to de-escalate a situ situation. The quickest way to escalate a situation when someone's in duress or distress is to mis is misgender them, right? And not use their, their name, right? So it's like, this is kind of one of those arguments where it's like, oh yeah, I guess I do need to do that in order to de-escalate and create 
police safety, right? So it's, it's, it's not untrue, but finding exactly the same way you say, where it's like all roads lead to this, which way do we want to take? And, the, and I think a smart advocate will say, what is the path I'm on to get to that place? Instead of sort of trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, that might be a square hole. And if you have an inability to recognize that it's a square hole, you're not going to be as effective because you're using the wrong tool. Yeah, and I, I mean, just to, to add on to what you're talking about, that's why I think a diversity of tactics is so important in this, right? Because like, like the, we're familiar with the, the kinds of uh, tactical differences in social justice movements, right? I think we, we've seen this with the LGBT folks, like not everyone agreed with ACT UP's uh, tactics, right? And yet, I, I think it's important to recognize that they just serve different purposes, right? If you're doing a public protest and you're trying to, uh, you know, if you're trying to get in the news, being willfully provocative uh, is awesome. And I think that like public protests are really about pushing people that already agree with you to either agree with you harder or take a specific step, step like contact their legislature. Uh, whereas like lobbyists, are about meeting people where they're at. Like if you're sitting across the table from a senator, like that senator, like yelling at them is not gonna change their mind. They have more institutional power. But holding a public protest where you yell at people is super effective at lots of other goals. And it, it's like, we're, we're, at, we're all in this together, if that makes sense. But there's not one note or one argument that's going to win this. I do wanna say, as, as a historically minded purpose person, I, I reject the idea of the inevitable, like an, an, inev an inevitable step toward, towards progress. So I think like decrim advocates are right, but being right has never been enough. And there's nothing inevitable about us winning this fight. And there are actually a lot of ways for this to go wrong. We could end up with the Nordic model, which like sounds like a dumb idea and is a dystopian nightmare. We could end up with legalization that only benefits brothel owners. We could end up with further criminalization, but also with like the surveillance state. Like there are a lot of ways for this to get bad. Um, and that's why I think it's so important that we bring all of our guns to the table including the ability to like sit and nod across from like a chauvinistic dude that doesn't understand how problematic he is, but represents district 704 or whatever. I wanna emphasize that your point uh, about diversity I think is super important. And we did a lot of advocacy work in Florida last year that was, we failed, utterly failed. Um, but we, we tried really, really hard. And I, I think that we're in the South and we're in Florida and it was an anti-trafficking law that, that ultimately passed. And it was based on faulty evidence, incredibly problematic, non-evidence-based research, right? That was not peer reviewed public. So I, I wanna emphasize the diversity as well and trying, I think, Caitlin, what you were saying in terms of health and safety, which is part of the reason why all of my, most all of my research questions focus on this concept of violence and trafficking, because that's what people can get behind. Most general people don't want there to be trafficking and violence against anyone, right? Anyone, most especially minors and, and kids and whatever, blah, blah, blah. But, and I, I just want to emphasize too, Barb, I'm thrilled about your research because I think if we can get, I tell cops all the time when I talk to them, I'm like, who is better situated to come forward about trafficking than sex workers and clients? And so if we have the research that, I, and I had a conversation at a party years ago with a cop explaining this to him and he was basically like, what? And I was like, I'd like to believe that clients would, would want to be at the forefront, that the majority of clients are not out there saying let's go get victims i want to have sex with victims like it's more about and they and they hear that all the time in new zealand clients will call and say this seems fishy to me there seems something you know different here so i think all of these things and then again as a researcher you know melissa you're a lawyer we're all our own positionalities but i think pushing on that evidence-based research we can't just have these feelings being in this christian country where it's like oh it's purient laws and blah, 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 blah. No, we have to look at the evidence and what's gonna provide more safety and health. Um, I really wanna ask uh, a question about, uh, and I think it'd be great for this audience, but maybe the answer can come in the next session uh, because we've technically run out of time here, but, but leave these in your head to answer. And that is what are the, what is the specific research 
you need researchers to do? Like what, what, are, what is the specific, I mean, our, our research won't necessarily give you, it, it won't, may not turn out exactly as you want, of course, that's what finding <laughs> truth is all about, but I do want to know what the questions are. I mean, because the other side tends to base it so much on not evidence-based. I agree, Barb. And you know, I can't make the next panel um, because I have to take my kid up to school, who you many of you saw just now. Um, but would you please capture that if people do answer that question and share that with us after? Because I think it's a really, really important question to be answered. All right, well, with that, I'm going to end this for now. And thank you all. This has been a wonderful panel. Thank you, thank you all. Sorry we didn't give you a chance to talk much, but uh, next Thank you guys for being here. Ask. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.